Hello and welcome to the channel where we discuss medical topics and lifestyle. In today's video, we are talking about tennis elbow, otherwise known as lateral epicondylitis. It's a common, often debilitating disorder, frequently encountered in primary care across low and high resource settings. It's not specific to just playing tennis, but it is related to that repetitive movement, which we will get into. And we are going to be covering the usual things, but as a hopeful message going forward, symptoms of tennis elbow or lateral epicondylitis, they usually resolve within a year um, with activity modification and watchful waiting. So that's just something to keep in mind. So let's get into the video now. So we're going to be talking about tennis elbow. Who gets it? So as we mentioned, it's not specifically just tennis players. We're going to be talking about what it actually is. So some of the pathology around it, how it's diagnosed. So how is tennis elbow actually diagnosed? And of course, how do we manage it? So we're going to cover some of the um, newer treatments that have emerged over the past 20 years. We're going to cover some of the current treatment manage uh, management uh, options that are available, which might surprise you, might not be as popular nowadays. So let's, let's get into it. So let's talk about who gets tennis elbow or lateral epicondylitis. So the incidence of lateral epicondylitis is 1.5 to 2.4 cases per thousand people. So this is according to research from the United States. Most population studies have been carried out in a high resource setting. So occupational exposure, that can predispose to the development of tennis elbow or tendinopathy. Um, lateral epicondylitis, it's more prevalent in people whose profession involves manual work. So that's what occupational exposure means. Um, so it's related to the work. Um, so there's a particular link to forceful or repetitive movements. And as expected, a lifetime of work. So it peaks around the ages of 40 to 50. There are other risk factors, of course, so steroid use, smoking history. So these are big risk factors, as well as the link to other upper limb problems. So things such as rotator cuff issues, De Quervain's disease, and also carpal tunnel syndrome. So these are all topics, obviously, we'll cover in other videos, but it's important to just understand the risk factors and the incidence and who is most likely to get lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow. And next, we're going to talk about what it actually is. So what is lateral epicondylitis? What are these terms that we're throwing around? Um, so itis, meaning inflammation. So uh, tendinitis, meaning inflammation of a tendon. So tennis elbow equals lateral epicondylitis. Type of tendinosis, that's what it is. It's a type of tendinosis. It's a degenerative process where repetitive stress, like we mentioned earlier, causes fibroblast deposition with collagen disorganization and vascular hyperplasia. Very fancy words, but basically meaning that the pain um, causes underuse of the affected arm, which then further complicates things. It causes an inflammatory process of the tendon there, complicates things, and then you can end up with things like a tendon rupture later on, for example. And it's actually quite interesting because studies have shown that symptoms, meaning the lateral elbow pain, often is related to excessive loading of the lateral extensor tendons in the elbow, as well as repetitive wrist extension and supination movements. So wrist extension, hand flat on the table, you raise your raise your hand at the wrist. Supination, hand flat on the table, and you turn your arm around so your hand, hand is then facing upwards, your palm. So we defined tennis elbow. We understand what it is, the symptoms of it, and uh, who gets it. How is it diagnosed? Well, this is the easiest part of the video, actually. So it is a clinical diagnosis. So patients usually present to primary care to their GP describing pain in the lateral aspect of the elbow and radiating down towards the forearm to the wrist. It presents similarly to a muscle strain, but can progress to involve the tendon, causing more severe pain. Most people experience symptoms when using their forearm or wrist only, although some patients, the, patient, the pain can uh, persist and occur at night, leading to sleep disturbances and things like that. It can be really debilitating. You know, it can affect your daily life. Grip strength can be affected. It can be reduced because of the pain. Many patients find it difficult to, you know, hold cutlery, open, open jars, things like that. Range of motion is not usually affected, but you can experience stiffness, and because of the underuse of the arm, more complications can then develop. And now we move on to the management. So management is split up into primary care management and secondary care management. So in primary care management, what is the first thing the GP is going to do? Well, we're going to watch and wait, to be honest. So we're going to rest and avoid the painful movements as much as we can. I know work is involved generally, so let's try to make some workplace adjustments. We can reassess then after three to six months 
But for now, it's just resting and avoiding the painful movements, some painkillers, pain relief, ibuprofen, paracetamol, those kinds of things, anti-inflammatories, they can be a help. And uh, we reassess the situation in three or six months, sometimes considering some physiotherapy along the way. Generally, physiotherapy is implemented probably six to eight weeks after it hasn't resolved. Um, interestingly to note, there's no universal actual program of physiotherapy that exists for lateral epicondinase specifically. But nonetheless, there can be certain exercises, certain movements that can help. Two important things to distinguish here in terms of therapy, steroid injections and acupuncture. Acupuncture actually has no sustained evidence to support its use. So it's, uh, it's insufficient, actually. Steroid injections are a little bit different. So while they can provide short-term symptom relief, the effects may wane long-term. So even they, um, the symptoms can return, and even when the symptoms then return after within a year's time, then physiotherapy is even less successful. So steroid injections, a bit, a bit in the gray zone, I would say. And then we move on to secondary care management, so orthotics. So, so there's high quality evidence, supports the use of orthotics to alter the force factors across the tendon, and offload the area of diseased tendon issue. So orthotics, very cool, very useful. Autologous blood injections and platelet-rich plasma injections. So these have become increasingly more popular in high resource settings in the past 20 years. So samples are collected from the patient, injected around the lateral epicondyle to trigger an inflammatory reaction and facilitate the tendon recovery with cellular mediators. So you're basically doing a little bit, a little bit of a damage to promote it to heal itself. And finally. We have shockwave therapy and laser therapy, both of which, again, are a bit in the gray zone, a bit inconclusive evidence to suggest anything. And there was a lot covered there. So now let's just do a quick, quick summary and very easy management of it, whether you're um, a doctor studying for exams or anything, or whether you're a patient looking for the timeline of management. So we have primary care and secondary care management. In primary care management, so we have initially the patient coming to the GP and us diagnosing lateral epicondylitis. So how do we diagnose lateral epicondylitis? In most cases, it is a clinical diagnosis. So that's the diagnosis of lateral epicondylitis. Then what are we going to do about it? How do we manage it? So in primary care, we do simple analgesia and activity modification. So those things we mentioned, maybe change the way we work, maybe take some simple painkillers and see how that goes. We consider physiotherapy if the symptoms have been persistent for four to six weeks. If that's the case, we will consider some physiotherapy. And then if there is persistence of symptoms at three to six months, then we are gonna get secondary care involved. So secondary care gets involved after three to six months of persistent symptoms. And there we have what we mentioned earlier on. So we have the consideration of orthotics, the proven proven evidence evidence suggested material. So orthotics, we have the autologous blood and platelet rich plasma injections. So that's what we have. And we also have the percutaneous needle fenestration. So that works in a similar way to the injections where a needle goes into the tendon, causes a little bit of micro damage. It's often done in conjunction with the blood or platelets. And then if all of that fails, we will be considering surgery. That's the last resort. So this is very easy timeline of management, the summary of what we've talked about here, primary care, secondary care. That's it for the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Please leave a comment in the section below, like and subscribe for more, and we will see you in the next one.